Well, hello again. It's uh, good to be back into this study with you guys. Uh, Caleb and I have obviously kind of been doing some tag teaming on this, and we'll continue to do some tag teaming. Uh, but I'm going to be back with you for the next couple of weeks, and uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the book of Ezra. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of favors from you tonight, if you don't mind. The first favor is... Um, know that we're going to be covering a lot of dates and trying to set up the next three books that we're going to be studying. I don't want to get these dates wrong or mixed up or anything, so I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, uh, reading from my notes, so I'll be looking down a lot. I know that's not the most user-friendly way to uh, teach a class online, but if you'll just give me that break, uh, uh, just in this lesson, it, it'll be helpful so that I can uh, set up the next three studies with some dates and as well as some terminology uh, to kind of help us uh, stay on the same page through these, these next three books because they are, in many respects, uh, it could be combined uh, to, to cover the 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 basic focus that we'll be looking at, at least. So I, I just ask for that favor tonight uh, as I look down and read at my notes. And uh, just want to encourage you uh, to, I'll have some snapshots of things fired up uh, with our timelines and stuff on it that you can take notes from, and I'll leave them up there for a pretty good length of time. And I'll make note of those important aspects of the charts that uh, I'd encourage you just to remember the, the names or dates that we're going to be taking a look at. So I'll be breaking this up into sections looking at uh, the, the, the book itself, just a really quick overview. We'll be looking at the authorship of, of this particular book. And then we will uh, try to take a look at how we can interpret some passages that kind of point to Christ as well. And then we'll look at the two sections of this book in greater detail that cover uh, the rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of the people, which is going to be pretty much the, the standard focus that Ezra is going to be talking about in this book. So get your Bibles ready, get your notes ready if you'd like. And uh, let's get started taking a look at the book of Ezra. Okay, the book of Ezra. Ezra is going to continue uh, where we left off with uh, the book of Chronicles, primarily 2 Chronicles that we took a look at, by showing us how God's going to fulfill his promise to return his people back to the promised land. When we take a look at this return um, that's going to be covered in the book of Ezra, I think it's significant to kind of note that it's just, it's really not as impressive of an exodus as what we saw earlier when they, when Israel left Egypt. And I think that's primarily because there's only going to be a very small remnant of about 50,000 people that are going to be the initial return that, uh, that Ezra is going to tell us about. So with, with that understanding, Ezra's going to relate to us two different stories during two different events, if you will. Ezra's going to start with this small remnant that's going to be focusing upon the, the rebuilding of the temple itself. That's where Ezra feels like he needs to begin, is to rebuild that temple first, and then the rest of the st stuff, if you will, will be second. Uh, the second aspect of this book is going to be Ezra focusing on the restoration, the, the bringing together of the people themselves as they recommit themselves to God. Uh, that's going to be the focus, the two sections, just a really high overview of this particular book as we get into it. So you might take some time and look at the first section, which is going to be Ezra 1 through 6. And that's going to be focusing on the temple, as we've said. And then as we get over into 7 through 10, 
We're going to focus more on the restoration of the people. And we'll have more to say about this in greater detail as we continue in our study tonight. So that's just a basic introduction of what you can expect as we go forward in the book of Ezra. Authorship of this book. Uh, nowhere in the book is anything specifically stated that Ezra was the author of this book, but certainly tradition, Jewish tradition, uh, the Talmud, uh, essentially, uh, ascribes authorship of this book to Ezra. Um, the vividness that we see written in here can really only come from someone that was an eyewitness of these events. And certainly Ezra was a contemporary of Nehemiah. And so if he would have more, more than likely been able to cons talk with Nehemiah about what all what had transpired from his point of view, as well as from, from Ezra's. And so I think as we began to kind of take a look at this book, although there isn't a specific author mentioned, we can uh, probably have a pretty good foundation upon saying that Ezra was the the author of this. And, and there's a lot of, of, of priestly terminology and usage in this book as well. And, and I think it's important to note that Ezra was a direct descendant of Aaron. So that being said, he certainly had studied the law. He had certainly uh, lived out the law that was important in his life, which kind of starts to, to move us into a little bit of aspect of the character of this particular author. He's He was a godly man. He was really focused upon a strong trust in the Lord. There was a in moral integrity at his center, and certainly he, he was grieving over sin. And so these were things that motivated Ezra and were a part of the writings that we'll start to look at in greater detail today. All right, as we're talking about timeline, I think it's going to be important for us to have two chronological uh, events to show to help us understand when things are happening and the order that they're happening. The first chronological event that we want to take a look at is this chart that you see right here. Uh, this chart is demonstrating the relationship between the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And here in a minute as I'm reading through the events and when, it's, when stuff is happening, there's going to be the kings of Persia that are going to be mentioned. And that's going to be the second chronological event that's going to be important for you to see. And so I'm going to keep these two side by side as I'm reading through the timeline and uh, chronological events of this particular book and how it's relating to Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther on the whole. All right, so let's get that timeline up. Cyrus the Persian, he's going to be the, the first king that you notice there on the Persian side of kings. Rule from around 559 through 530 BC. He overthrows Babylon in October around 538 BC. And he issues his decree allowing the Jews to return in 538 BC. The temple is begun in around 536 BC, and the exile lasts only 50 years after 586 BC, but the 70-year figure for the captivity is taken from the beginning date of 607 BC, when the first deportation to Babylon takes place. The rebuilding of the temple is discontinued in 534 BC, and then resumed in 520 B.C., and ultimately completed around 515 B.C. It is begun under Cyrus and is finished under Darius I. The two, these two kings, Cambius and Smyrdas, 
are not mentioned in any of the books. The prophets, Haggai or Zechariah's ministry during Zerubbabel's time around 520 BC and the following years. Esther's story fits entirely in the reign of Xerxes. And Ezra ministers during the reign of Xerxes I, as does Nehemiah. There were three waves of deportation to Babylon. The 606 uh, date that we've already said, then a 597, and then 586 B.C., and three returns from Babylon, 538 B.C. under Zerubbabel, 457 under Ezra, and then 444 under Nehemiah. So that's just a real quick look at the relationship between the, the Israelites and the events that are happening in their history, and then the overarching uh, world that's uh, basically over, it's, they're living in their captivity time under these Persian kings. So that being said, that's basically all we're going to take a look at in terms of the timeline of this particular book and the books that we're going to be looking at in the next few weeks. Okay, I just want to do a little bit of, of reflection, if you will, over how you might consider the, the life and ministry of Jesus and how, there, how that might parallel with some things that we see in the book of Ezra. Ezra, on a whole, is about the continual fulfillment of God's promises to the people of Israel that we've looked at in other studies. Zerubbabel himself is going to be part of the messianic line uh, of Jesus. There's this positive note of hope that comes out in our story of the remnant coming home and the restoration of the temple and the people themselves. And certainly we can hear some parallels with the ministry of Jesus and what's going on in the book of Ezra. There is, in a sense, God has rebuilt his temple in each and every one of us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's also this ongoing restoration in each and every one of our lives as we are constantly being transformed, as Paul will remind us in Romans chapter 12, in, into his likeness. And so there's this restoration that goes on in our lives as Christians that we see the, the same thing happening to the people of Israel on both a physical and spiritual level as well as, as it is for you and I today. The book of Ezra is going to typify that work of Christ. It's going to talk about forgiveness and it's going to talk about restoration. And these are the very foundational principles that we live our lives by in Christ. All right, some important keys to the book of Ezra. Let's look first at a key word that happens in this book, and that has to be the word temple. The basic theme of Ezra is the restoration of the temple and the spiritual, moral, and social restoration of the returned remnant in Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Ezra. Israel's worship is going to be revitalized, and the people are going to be purified. It shows how God's faithfulness is seen in the way that he is sovereign over the affairs uh, during the process of the rebuilding of this temple. God's going to rise up even pagan kings that will be sympathetic to the cause of helping the people of Israel rebuild their temple and the land around it. It's almost as if you could say that uh, God also shows uh, that his leaders that he is riding, uh, rising up are, are zealous, they are righteous, they are spiritual and capable leaders to accomplish what it is that God wants to do, which is to fulfill uh, his promise that he made back in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah will say, I will be found by you, 
says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all of the nations and from all of the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away from. And so that's what we see happening in the restoration of the temple, the rebuilding of the temple, is God is in the process of fulfilling that promise he made in Jeremiah and fulfilling that promise that goes all the way back to Abraham in which God promises that he will rise up a seed from, these, from the people of Israel. Well, a key verse that we want to take a look at is in Ezra uh, 1 and 3, and 7, 10 and following. Let's take a look first at Ezra 1 and 3. Who is there among you of all the people? May his God be with him. Now let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. There we've got the stated purpose, the what's going to be the focus if, in the book of Ezra is this rebuilding of the temple. And this passage helps us see the clarity in which uh, the, this purpose is to be accomplished. It's going to be done in a particular place. These places are going to be important in the promise itself. Bethlehem, Jerusalem, these are all places in which the Messiah was promised to come. And so this passage in Ezra is a rec is a reclaiming of what uh, God has promised and a fulfillment of what he has said through the prophet Jeremiah. The other uh, uh, Ezra passage, uh, chapter 7, verse 10, For Ezra has prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. And God is always about providing for his people what they need, not always what we want, but what we need. And God has prepared this capable leader, Ezra, to begin the process of what he wants to accomplish, and that is the rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of his people according to the promise, the, the Abrahamic promise that we've looked at in previous uh, books and all the way through this study. Well, a key chapter, Ezra chapter 6, it records the completion and dedication of the temple, which stimulates the obedience and the remnant to keep the Passover and separate themselves from the filth of the nations of the land, as stated in 6.21. Well, there's just some key aspects of the book of Ezra. There's the key word, temple. There's these key verses that we'll be taking a look at. And now let's close things out by doing a survey of the book itself. And we're going to begin by pulling up a chart. We're going to keep this chart up as we are surveying uh, the book uh, as a point of reference for you with what I'm saying, you can pause the video if you want to kind of digest the information that you're giving or just follow right along um, as I'll use some of the key words that you see on this chart. So let's, let's pull that chart up. You'll notice right off the bat at the top, the focus, we've already talked about the restoration of the temple. Uh, and that's covering chapters 1 through 6. And then 7 through 10 is going to be focusing primarily on the uh, Reformation, reformation of the people. The division of it is going to cover uh, the first return to Jerusalem and the uh, construction of the temple. And all that's going to be under Zerubbabel. And the timeline along this lines is about 22 years. Now, when we get to chapter 7, we're taking a look at the reformation of the people. It's going to cover the second return to Jerusalem under Ezra. And it's going to be about one year in the making, about 458 through 457. But let's take a look first at this restoration of the temple. Uh, king, The king of Persia, Cyrus, has overthrown Babylon in 539 B.C., and he's issued a decree in 538 
that allows the exiled Jews to return to their homeland. Isaiah promised two centuries before the temple, before that, that the temple would be rebuilt and actually named Cyrus as the one who would bring it all about. Isaiah 44, 28 through 45 through four, or, uh, through verse 4. If you want to take a look at that. Cyrus may have read and responded to this passage. You, you, we just don't know. But out of the total Jewish population of perhaps two, three million, only a little under 50,000 chose to take advantage of this offer to return to the homelands. Only the most committed seemed to be willing to leave their life of relative comfort in Babylon, endure a trek of 900 miles, and face further hardship by rebuilding and uh, rebuilding this destroyed temple and city. Zerubbabel, a prince of Judah, a direct descendant of King David, leads the faithful remnant back to Jerusalem. And those who return are from the twelve are from the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. But it is evident that the representatives from the other ten tribes eventually return as well. So in a sense, the, the ten lost tribes aren't essentially lost. Uh, if we're reading this particular book correctly. Zerubbabel's priorities are in the right place. He first restores the altar and the religious feast before beginning work on the temple itself. The foundation of the temple is laid in 536 BC, but opposition arises and the work ceases from 534 to 520. While Ezra 4 verses 1 through 5 and 24 concerns Zerubbabel, 4, 6 through 23 concerns the opposition of the building of the wall of Jerusalem sometime between uh, 464 and 444 BC. These verses, they may have been placed here to illustrate the antagonism to the work of rebuilding. We're just not exactly sure. But the prophet Haggai and Zechariah exhort the people to get back to work on the temple in chapters 5, verses 1 and 2. And the work begins again under Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. Tatania, a prince, a Persian governor, he's going to protest King Darius I about the temple building and challenges uh, their authority to even continue the King Darius finds the decree of Cyrus and confirms it, and he will even enforce, uh, have Tatian or force him to provide whatever is needed to get the work completed. And it is finished by 515 BC. And so that's just a quick rundown of chapters 1 through 6. Now let's t turn our attention to 7 through 10. The people of Israel, a smaller return under Ezra, takes place in 457 B.C. That's about 81 years after the first return under Zerubbabel. Ezra, the high priest, is given authority by King Xerxes I to, to bring the people and contributions for the temple in Jerusalem. God, he's going to protect, uh, protect this band of less than 2,000 men and they safely reach Jerusalem with their valuable gifts from Persia. A many priests, but a few Levites uh, themselves return with Zerubbabel and Ezra. And we got some indications of that in chapter 2, verses 36 through 42, and chapters 8, 15 through 19. God is going to use Ezra. He's going to use him to rebuild the people spiritually and morally. And when Ezra discovers that the people and the priest have intermarried with foreign women, he identifies with the sin of his people and offers this great intercessory prayer on their behalf. But during this gap of 58 years between Ezra chapter 6 and verse 7, the people fall into confused spiritual states, and Ezra, he, be, he becomes alarmed. They quickly respond to Ezra's confession and weeping, 
by making a covenant to put away their foreign wives and to live in accordance to God's law. This confession in response to the word of God brings about this great revival of changed lives. So that's just a quick run through of the book of Ezra. Encourage you to read through it at your pace. Encourage you to take some time to take a look at who's coming, uh, when they're coming. Take a look at the support that the people get. So much is happening in this book. So much is going on over a relatively short period of time. But it's an important book as we kick off our study of, of Israel coming out of captivity and into the place in which Jesus is to be born. So that's our study for today. I want to invite you to come back next week as we take a look at the book of Nehemiah and continue our discussion on the rebuilding of temple and the people. God bless you. Have a great week. See you next Wednesday.